Hey, I'm Michael, and I'm from San Jose. If you're enjoying Low Profile, please consider supporting the show by donating at patreon.com slash lowprofile. It also helps out a ton when you subscribe and give the show a good rating. Tell a friend who might like the show as well. The Morrison family will be forever grateful, and it will help Mark Lee continue to deliver these long-form interviews. And now, here's today's show. Now, I'm a musician myself, and in the 22 years I've been messing with it, I don't think I've ever run across anybody that plays the electric rake. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> I'm on to something, finally. How in the world did you ever decide, uh, or how, how did it hit you, that the electric rake might make a nice instrument, musical instrument? Well, I was already involved in the type of music where uh, an electric rake would fit right in. My music's always been kind of off the wall. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you just thought, what the heck, right? I'll pick up one and put an amplifier. Now, let's talk a little bit about your rake. I will they say, hey, I like this guy. I'd like to uh, get behind him financially and uh, see if I can't get him into Nashville. Have you ever thought about going to Nashville? I... What you're hearing is the music of Eugene Chadbourne. Eugene has been making his very unique blend of avant-garde, free jazz, country western, noise music, folk, blues, and uh, anything in between, uh, but exactly how you would not imagine it. And I am really pleased to be sitting face to face with him alongside with my buddy Arrington. Hey, what's up? Uh, <laughs> hi, Eugene. Hey, what's up? Thanks for doing the show. We're at the Quality sure. Inn. This yes. Is, this is my uh, almost five-year-old daughter's favorite hotel. Hey, that's nice to hear, and it's nothing but quality with Doc Chad. <laughs> Absolutely. So... You, you call yourself Doc Chad. Are you you're indeed a doctor? No. Oh. My father was. He used to call himself the real Doctor Chad. Okay. You no, know, it's like a kind of mad doctor, or it's it's short for dropout. But uh, oh anyway. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So you're touring right now. You're you're touring yeah. West most Coast. of the time. West or? Coast. No, I no. mean it's really hard to organize. Yeah. Tours, it takes months of preparation. It's hard to do on tour. So, yeah, it's kind of... And I like being home, so, I mean, I'm not... Ton, but I, I try to keep active with stuff. and So I'm doing... Because I like playing. Yeah. Now, with all your uh, different, different monikers and different projects you've had, I couldn't even round out about how large your discography is. All, all I know is that it's larger than I think. <laughs> and... Um, my introduction to your music personally was because a friend of mine, she was looking for music by Roger Miller. Okay. And somehow the internet spat out at her, your Roger Miller medley. Right. From right. the LSD, right. C&W right. I have project. probably done more Roger Miller covers than anyone on the face of the earth. And of yeah. course we're talking about the country singer because sometimes there's some confusion with um, Mission of Burma. Right. Oh, and that's not the same guy? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought they had, you know, had a really diverse Well, if you went on the all-music guide, they might tell you it's the same guy. But he did cover uh, King of the Road, though, on one of his albums. I think someone told me that. Yeah. That's very appropriate. Yeah. My wife bought it because yeah. she was like, who the hell is this other Roger Miller? That's really funny. I thought they were the same yeah. guy. No, Roger Miller, the country <laughs> artist, that was really a, a, a standard thing on the radio when I was a teenager. Oh, yeah. In the days of the kind of uh, top 40 radio where um, 
And so the genres were really mixed together. They've kind of taken the black music and the country western and everything and the rock and roll and separated it all. Now, they've even taken the rock and roll and separated it into the different eras on the radio. So, uh, But growing up, Roger Miller always, uh, for quite a few years, he would have a hit on the radio, and they were always some of the funniest songs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he's just a real kooky guy. I yeah. Can, I could definitely see how you gravitated toward him. And I, I feel like that was a good marriage of uh, someone new yourself that I was familiar with, with Roger Miller. And it just made perfect sense from then on. Like, I felt like I got you, whatever you were doing. I think it also, the only uh, reaction of a, an original country artist to one of my recordings that has been reported to me was a disc jockey told me they had Roger Miller on the radio, I think in Chicago when they were promoting that um, uh, Broadway show he did uh, about the Mississippi River. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, uh, they played him something and he said, I don't know what that is and what the hell is going on or something like that, which I thought was great, you know. So. They played him one of your, yeah, your yeah, tributes. Yeah, but he said, apparently the guy said he was really um, happy that people were still working with his music, although I, you know, there's a lot of other country artists that get a lot more attention, Johnny Cash, for instance, from people like recording. Sure. Stuff. The Roger Miller stuff is tricky, and it's really crazy, so. Yeah, it's very yeah. unconventional, yeah. and it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, like you said, really comedic, yeah. um, even even in the music itself, there's yeah. comedy sometimes. Oh, no, definitely. Like, like uh, that oh. song, Her Name Is. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's George, that's a George Jones. Oh, I mean, I think, I'm right. not sure who wrote that. I think it's Bobby Braddock. I think it's the same guy that wrote I'm the Only Hell My Mom Ever Raised. And yeah. Other clever songs. Yeah, Roger Miller, you know, My Uncle Used to Love Me But She Died. Yep, is yep. a typical example. There's Dang Me. King Dang the, Me, Do Wackadoo. Yeah, yeah. Kansas Chug -a -lug, City Star. Chug -a -lug. Yeah, Kansas City Star. Some of them are just really crazy. Well, yeah. I hope anyway. you listeners are enjoying this episode about Roger Miller. Right. <laughs> I got a letter just this morning. It was postmarked Omaha. Omaha! Omaha, I said. I said Omaha. It was typed and neatly written, offering me a better job. A better job, I said! Better job. Better job at higher wages. They even offered me an expense account and a car. But I'm on TV here locally. I can't quit. I'm the star. Oh, come on, me grinning, wearing pistols in a hat. When I'm a hero of the younger set I'm the number one attraction Every supermarket parking lot King of Kansas City, no thanks Omaha, thanks a lot Kansas City star, that's what I are Yodelay, ooh yodelay -ye -ye Y'all to see my car I drive a big old Cadillac with wide wheels I got rhinestones on the spokes Credit down at the grocery store Where my bartender tells me jokes I'm the number one attraction Every supermarket parking lot King of Kansas City, no thanks Omaha, thanks a lot <laughs> I, I, I actually own just Vermin of the Blues mm -hmm. and uh, the original Country Protest. Right, right. Um, and, and that's it. That's all I've come across in the wild. So um, <laughs> I'm really excited to peruse your suitcase full of, uh, <laughs> of right, material today right. because... Well, a lot of people thought uh, Vermin of the Blues was, I think, uh, some of the tracks on that really got a lot of airplay on college radio at the time. A lot of people told me that had the best kind of uh, sound from the traditional perspective. And I mean, it was, a, it was a really nice studio in Austin where they did a lot of rock and roll and rhythm and blues and the band was a really good rock and roll band but we also had control of that studio for the whole weekend this phenomenon they call the lockout yeah and in yeah. the middle of the night i recorded an album for a noise band from um greensboro a duo called chuck we tracked that whole thing in the middle of the night. There was so there was a whole range of activity going on in the studio when that record was made. Um, uh, all the way from like really straight rock and roll to uh, this really strange stuff, and uh, it would all kind of cross pollinated. With it was it was some really interesting mixing going on. It was fun, um, and then of course I'd say the most successful track on the record was Bo Diddley as a communist, because in uh, some communist countries where they had 
student radio, this was a real big deal. Um, and the best comment about it was that somebody in East Germany said they really loved it, but they didn't know what Bo Diddley was. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> And then, yeah, you, you also called uh, you called out Bob Dylan on, uh, what was it that you said? Bob Dylan writes propaganda songs? Well, that's, uh, yeah, so that's a Minutemen song. That's another yeah. Minutemen? All those, so that was everything that on that record, it, it started out as being Minutemen, all Minutemen. Okay. Psalm uh, of Sir Douglas Quintet, and then I share a real love of him with these uh, Sun Watchers, with Jim McHugh and the rest of them. Doug Psalm kind of got in there like, <laughs> he just, next thing you, you know, what we recorded a couple of Doug Psalm songs that were going to be part of it, and then they also wanted to do a piece by uh, Henry Flint, who is also from Greensboro, uh, coincidentally, mm, but it's associated with really? the New York scene, and this Uncle Sam Do, which is a really political piece, which sort of fit in with everything. So, but uh, all the rest of this stuff on the um, uh, record is uh, uh, Minutemen songs. Um, I've had my fun with Bob Dylan over the years, too, of course, you know, because I grew sure. up with his music. I, I uh, used to play at a coffee. My, the first place I used to play publicly, basically, other than uh, teenage stoner parties, was uh, the coffee house in, at CU in Boulder. And the, the guy that used to dominate and play there all the time, I don't remember this guy's name, but all he did was Bob Dylan covers. So listening to him, I, got a, I, I developed a really good imitation of Bob Dylan that I would throw in from time to time. Uh, we, we used to, uh, g g like during the plunger and rake solos with Shockabilly, we would sometimes throw in these imitations of various things like that. So, and then I, there, on even a record called um, uh, Country Music from Southeast Australia, we did a little bit that was an imitation of um, one of these late night radio things with like uh, all the hits of Bob Dylan and I was like, hey, Joe, little red monkey, little red bike. And just going on and on. Did you see on. Bob Dylan walk through <laughs> here? <laughs> <laughs> just, just going on and on with it. So it's funny. And, and you know, you have to be happy that somebody has a voice that's so easy to imitate. And sometimes he sounds like he's imitating himself on his record. Oh, it's yeah, really yeah. I, 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 I love the whole period where he suddenly had this kind of smooth, 
Nashville he, skyline. Yeah, no, he's just really portrait. And then he wins he wins the Nobel Prize and writes an essay plagiarizing like some college essay of that. I mean, <laughs> the guy is just so weird. I mean, I, I what can I say? <laughs> now, I want to I want to rewind a little bit because you mentioned uh, plunger and electric rake. Right. And I have a feeling like there might be some people out here who don't know what the <laughs> fuck you're talking about. I I do. I know some what you're talking about. Some people do. I mean, it's something they might have experienced. Can you just break it down? I don't want you to get too parent. into it because I'm sure you've had to talk about that a lot. Oh, not but. so much. But it's funny. Um, uh, I, I started experimenting with using contact microphones on the guitar. One of my favorite things was uh, to actually hold a contact mic on the guitar pick while I was playing and it made an incredibly abrasive sound. And this was a, one of the things I was doing when I was playing with John Zorn, etc. cetera. Mm. And um, with the contact mics, uh, I get down to, we move down to Greensboro where you're suddenly like raking the yard and the people are always breaking their brakes and throwing, and then in Greensboro when you break something, you just put it out on the curb. And, Either the trash picks it up or some joker comes along and, hey, look, at that's a rake. I could put a new stick on this and have a rake. Anyway, so I, I got this rake and I decided to take it down to the club where we were doing a, a show that night and hook it up with the fuzz box. So I played this thing and people went absolutely wild. And, and, and after that, it was like people would be screaming, the rake, the rake, the rake. And so we wire, you know, I got that going with shock ability, and I also I, I made a toilet plunger with a guitar string on it that we would play like with a big long screw, you know, this kind of thing. We played whiter shade of plunger. The um, I think there might be a video of that. I, yeah, I think on there YouTube are. Or something. Yeah, there are old films of that. And yeah. um, the uh, the thing that was interesting with the plunger is actually because of the string, you could actually play melodies, whereas the rake was not really good for much except to kind of basic bass line and a lot of noise and scraping, Shock the, value. scraping the ground. Uh, it, it, as a soloist, it developed into something where I could actually kind of assault the environment I was in with the rake. I could go out and play the uh, play it on the floor. If it was a bar, I could get it on the pool table and have guys shoot pool balls at it. All kinds of stuff happened over the years. I would go under the stage. Um, people remember an event in Rome where I went under the stage and then out the, the side and nobody knew where I was and the rake was hanging off the side of the stage. I went all the way around the building. He came back in through the audience. <laughs> <laughs> They're all staring at this rake that was feeding back. So I had a lot of fun uh, doing that. Uh, eventually I got kind of tired of it though and I resented the fact that uh, one of the realities of life is, you know, you can, not that I'm calling myself a genius, but you can be an absolute genius and there are many of them doing music, films, etc. and nobody pays attention to you. And you do something really stupid and everybody talks about it. And another thing really bugged me, this couple that really likes my music, this is in Germany, I saw them, they took their kid outside, their baby, like they brought to the concert. They went outside when I was playing the electric rake and they said, we well, don't want her ears to be damaged. And I was like, well, I don't want to do anything that would damage anybody's ears. Why do I sure. want to do that? You know, so I got kind of, I've sort of lost interest in it. And now the funny thing is, I kind of, over the years, I realized, well, people really like that and it was fun. It's not like I want to deprive people of something, so nobody else seems to be doing it. I try to sell them, you know, and get someone else going with it, you know. Get someone else out there playing the rake. Yeah, sure. Eh, it didn't take off. But um, a couple of times, like just recently in Florida, I had a couple of days off. I had a couple of rakes with me I picked up off the street. I got them all wired up. I had them in the car. I brought them in the club. Nobody would ask for it or anything. And if in the course of the night, I don't think of doing it because it's a whole thing. I got to plug it in. Hopefully it will still work. You know, because of the nature of what you're doing. I mean, it's really hard to keep electric guitars working, let alone this damn thing where you've got this contact mic taped to something. 
you know, one night it works, the next night suddenly the cord doesn't work. You plug the whole thing in and the audience is watching and nothing happens. It's awful, you know? So I'm like, well, unless somebody really gets excited about this, I'm not going to go to all the trouble. So I have them and I hadn't played them, you know? So that's the current status of the thing. But uh, uh, in, in working out of Greensboro, I had to keep creating these things. I had the plunger. We had a, I had a whole... Um, evening's presentation called The Secret of the Cooler, hmm. where there were a lot of objects kept in a styrofoam cooler that were played with contact mics okay. as they were taken out. Uh, I was imitating a guy I'd seen with Miles Davis uh, in high school, Erdo Moriera. He sat on stage playing oh, weird okay. percussion stuff. Yeah. He had a chest. He had a kind of a chest, uh, uh, a wooden chest, and he kind of would reach in, and he never used the same thing twice the whole night. It was so cool. So he had all this stuff in there leading to this dog skull that I had found. And that, was, that had like balloons in the eyes and a harmonica in the mouth and these things you could use with a contact mic. So this was all part of this performance. And that was the scene. So I did this cooler. whole series of things with homemade instruments in Greensboro, you know, because I had a regular club I could play at. And it was known for like weird, not only me, but some other local people, really weird music events. You know, you could do whatever you wanted down there. Um, mm. What's that I think the, I think it was called the Nightshade Cafe, and like anybody that lived in Greensboro during that period of time, that was the place, you know, uh, for a lot of different types of music. Uh, and then I had the Cadaver, uh, which I also did in New York, which was an entire. It looked like a dead body, but it was all made out of junk things that could be played with contact mics. As you dissected it with drills and saws. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, that that was a really intense. Experience. It sounds you know. like an intensive set. No, that made the rake sound like Muzak. <laughs> and, the, and and so you know, but these things, um, you know, I've lost jobs because of these stupid things. A guy was trying to get me a kind of a. This sounded like a really fun job. Uh, the Polish Legends of Rock Festival. It was in the mountains of Poland somewhere, mm. and you know they would have these groups like Wishbone Ash with one original member is playing at this thing. But they have a bar where they said, oh, they need someone to play in the evening in the bar that would play a lot of 60s covers, you know. And they said, I said, this guy, Eugene, he just knows all that stuff. He'd be great. So um, the, the promoter probably gets on the, online and sees an electric rake solo, and he's like, that wouldn't be great. <laughs> And I wrote a letter and I said that was great at where it was presented, where it was appropriate, you know. I said I would never do that and that in your bar. Don't worry about it, but they didn't hire me, so I lost yeah. a job because of that. And then with this cadaver, there was a uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this show used to be on TV called A Little Night Music. It was hosted by David Sanborn. Okay. And I've seen some clips. One of the music yeah. producers for it was Hal Wilner, who also works on Saturday Night Live. He's a guy I've known a long time. He really likes my music. And um, he was after David Sanborn to have me as a guest. David Sanborn didn't know anything about me. You know, and he kept saying, that, oh, this guy does. He, you know, Because the thing with night music is that you not only did your own show, song or something, you would uh, collaborate with some of the other guests. So um, he said, you know, this guy plays country, he plays jazz, he plays rock, he'd be really great on the show, you should check it out. So finally, when David Sanborn, of course, doesn't put any energy into this, but one night he's looking around on cable TV, and they're broadcasting this cadaver thing. And he's like, which is what they used to do from the knitting factory. Some of those shows were, were broadcast on this cable network. So he calls my friend up and goes, you could just forget about this Chadborn guy. So, you know, uh, that's a, that's one of the things about that kind of... So there's some people that's the only kind of music they do, you know. Sure, sure. The noise music. So, uh, you know, there's a kinship with, with that kind of thing. But I'm also really drawn to playing uh, songs, and I'm very nostalgic and sentimental about the music I grew up with that drew me into the guitar, and, and so... and then. I know, I kind of like try out different things uh, if I like it. Of course, I have to like it. If I really like it, then usually the people that like my music like it. But I definitely like um, 
uh, the stuff that gets reactions is the stuff that I, you know, definitely stick with. All shock, no yeah. rock. Yeah. Um, I know. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about uh, so we all share a, an affinity for Captain Beefheart. Mm -hmm. You've got um, an, a whole album with uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Jimmy Carl Jimmy Black. Jimmy Carl Black. Yeah, he loved Jim Beefheart. and Jack. Yeah, Jack and Jim. Jack and Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you've recorded more Captain Beefheart outside of that. Yeah, yeah, I keep a kind of a you know, uh, you, one at least one of his tunes when I play. He did he did let me lick my, my decals off, off baby. It's a, oh. a, a, va a Valentine's Day special. Oh, that's yeah. that's perfect. Yeah. yeah, and I was thinking to myself how funny that one of the most romantic songs of the evening is written by Captain B. Fart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm from Lancaster where Oh wow! Came up, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, Jim, you know, and uh, Jimmy also um, uh, knew uh, this whole uh, that whole area of California that was where Zappa came from. And yeah, stuff, that Jimmy knew exactly. a lot about him. Like when these these things that are mentioned in these songs, like the El Monte Legion Stadium, he would tell me all these stories about what that place was really like and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's it's funny because like Jimmy Carl Black's name is forever burned in my skull from that that section in uh, We're Only In It For The Money. Where, yeah, I'm where it's Jimmy. Like, I'm Jimmy Carl Black. I'm the Indian of the group. I know, that had an yeah. incredible, it just... It, 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 he's immortalized on I that. I know, it's uh, a, and, and not everything that somebody just happens to say on a record is immortalized. Hi, boys and girls. I'm Jimmy Carl Black. I'm the Indian of the group. People love... Now, I, you know, what I said to him was, well, for me... I loved hippies and rock bands, and I loved Indians. So at that point, I was like, wow, you could have an Indian in a rock band. I was so excited about it, you know? So. W w was he really uh, kind of in, in touch with that part of his heritage? Was he... Well, uh, yeah, I would say yeah. yes, and also Mexican, you know? Mm, that that okay. was a... That he, so uh, he was like a Tex-Mex guy, but... Oh, okay. uh, I th a quarter uh, Cheyenne, okay. you know, uh, his, his uh, I'm trying to remember his uh, mother or father. I think his mother was was uh, half Cheyenne, half Mexican, you know. Okay. Anyway, yeah, well, yeah, he, he definitely knew a lot about that. Used to play some nice Indian t Tom Tom beats and stuff, too. And, oh, cool. Uh, now, you've done a lot of Thelonious Monk, too. I love your interpretations of Monk's music. Thank you very much. His stuff, I can, you know, it's, yeah, it's a part just, of me. Yeah, no, he's and really incredible. Yeah, I'm wondering, I his songs. He, he did uh, Naima yeah. by Coltrane Naima. last night. Yeah, Coltrane, too. Yeah. yeah, Coltrane and Monk, those are some yeah. of my big mm -hmm. things, you know. Who do you think you, like... Pick one or two artists who you do more songs by than anybody else. Well, uh, Coltrane for sure. Uh, right now, I'm working on a whole bunch of them because I'm I'm gonna like to do like a solo guitar Coltrane album and not do the kind of more usual stuff people do. Mm -hmm. so, wow. Um, I'm really interested in some of the pieces he did in his later years where they would pile all these chords up on top of each other, and that's really a challenge. You, you ever been down to the church in San Francisco? Yep. I used to sell a lot of stuff to a record store across the street. Okay. I've been to Coltrane, the house he was born in, in Hamlet, North Carolina. And there's also a statue of him now in High Point, so that's nice. Hi, uh, Monk... Uh, Coltrane and Dizzy Gillespie. After years of fighting with the city council, who thought that might be a bad influence because they did drugs. Anyway, um, uh, Nick Drake, uh, I play a lot of his songs. I really like uh, his material. Phil Oaks, I've played a lot of stuff over the years. Sure. There are certain people, I mean, you get into their songwriting thing, you, they could just kind of take over, and so it's kind of like uh, I try to get my own stuff in there, but uh, Dolly Parton. Uh, Willie Nelson, Johnny Cash, uh, Roger Miller, as we mentioned, all these classic sure. country people. So, and then you're also doing a lot of improvisation and and writing millions of songs of your own. Well, I your try own, to, yeah, so. I do. I try to do at least a few of my own songs. Yeah. You know. But it's fun to reinterpret, you know. Yeah, the, it, did, it, did, it, it doesn't really make any difference to me. Uh, 
it, it all yeah it's the same feeling once I'm reinterpreting re something and now you, you mentioned Henry Flint is from the same he area as you. He was born in Greensboro. Yeah, apparently he grew up in a house there at least. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. When I first heard his uh, <coughs> his Nova Billy album, mm. I was like, I I think I'm gonna pick this up because that sounds like Eugene Chadbourne. <laughs> well, I didn't in a know. Way. Yeah, I didn't know anything about him at the at the time at all. That was a came as a complete surprise. But yeah sort of uh, all at the same time I got somebody sent me some stuff of his to review for the all music guide and then another guy I knew was re reissuing some of his stuff and then I um, gave some guitar lessons to a guy who's I started talking to the the, their, the guy's parents about uh, I don't know how we got on the subject of Henry Flint but I said I said he grew up somewhere in Greensboro and the woman said to me well, I work at the city of the deed of records. I'm sure I could find out where he grew up. And I mentioned that <laughs> to one of these record label guys. Somehow got that got back to him and he just apparently went, got very upset about that. You tell Eugene Chadbourne under no circumstances to look into that. I'm like, why, who the hell is he telling me what to do? And why does he care if, I, if I'm interested in what how? What does he think, I'm gonna put up a sign there or something? It's like San Francisco <laughs> with Janis Joplin. I mean, you know, there's a, they have a sign in front of this Janis Joplin's house, and, and these Japanese people live there, and they're like, they want to take the sign down. They don't give a shit about Janis Joplin. They're like, why are these people keep stopping and staring at our house? Anyway, well, well, again, like we, that's we, we, gonna we, happen we, we've, in we've Greensboro. We've got that in 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 town. We've got <laughs> friends who uh, were living in Kirk, one of Kurt Cobain's apartments. See, this is and just people just show up. And right? he had people yeah. from Japan yeah. who yeah. would come hang out there all the well, time. Well, you know, I understand the whole thing. You know, I I. I, I I went to Handel's house in Vienna. You know, I mean, it's like I did Bar Talk's house in Budapest. I just think it's it's interesting in a way. I don't know if I'd go to Kurt Cobain's house, but if, if I'm walking down the <laughs> street and apartment. somebody says, "Oh, Kurt Cobain lived there," I find that interesting. Yeah. I think that's cool. You know, you want to uh, you know um, imagine that in a way. You know. Yeah. While we're on that subject, where do you live? I, I live in Greensboro, North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah, but what house? Well, <laughs> you want the address. Well, you can get it in the phone book. Okay. That's a funny thing. Every year when college comes in, there's usually a few people that drive by the house and take a picture or something. Or like, wow. Somebody will say to me, I can't believe you're in the phone book. And I said, well, I had three daughters that grew up here. They weren't interested in not being in the phone book. You know? Yeah, so. No, it's not like I have people stalking me or anything. Um, when did you and... And uh, the the Jack and Jim, Jim and Jack, I keep mixing it's it up. It's Jack and Jim, and that okay. was uh, apparently when Jimmy was working with Captain Beefheart, he did a painting one day of Jimmy and a jackrabbit and gave it to him. And oh, wow. kept it anyway. We didn't have the painting. It was Jimmy said it was called Jack and Jim, so. But that Pachuco Cadaver was the album yeah. named yeah. for one of his songs. Yeah. And that yeah. was, what, in the early 90s, would you I say? I think so, yeah. Because yeah. I was, I, I was listening to Pachuco Cadaver's an instrumental, isn't it? It also has lyrics. Oh, it does? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I was listening to it recently, and um, I oh, noticed like that... It's all talking about cars and stuff. It's really you, you mentioned Rush Limbaugh in the <laughs> lyrics of a uh, $2 room and a $2 broom. <laughs> That's funny. And I'm just thinking, you know, you could bring that back now because he just got the know, Presidential yes. Medal of Honor. Oh, That's true. That's you know, Jim, true. I was listening to the radio the other day, the Rush Limbaugh fellow. Even he was saying the same thing. He came on the air and said... The world needs a good $2 room and a good $2 broom. What do you think about that? I believe he would say something like that. I'm glad I don't have to look at him anymore. I keep sweet. I mean, yeah, I the very first Jack and Jim CD, which was called Locked in a Dutch Coffee Shop. Uh, there's a piece called Ethnic Cleansing, and there, I... That was one of my favorite things I ever did because I had both Pat Buchanan and Richard Nixon going through a fuzz box on that, <laughs> making comments about things. Pat, Pat Buchanan talking about uh, George Washington's birthday has been changed into President's Day and, and all these kind of like things about uh, how we're losing sight of, you know, what it's like to be a real American, you know, and all this kind of stuff. It's, yeah, it, it dates it. It's funny. 
Yeah. But yeah, that stuff now keeps coming come back, back around. around. Well, yeah. yeah, it keeps coming back around. I, you know, I wish Jimmy was still here, but at least he died before he had to put up with Trump. Yeah, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. amen. Yeah. Um, you have any, uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about your days with Shockabilly and how mm-hmm. that, how it, how it came to be and what was that like, I guess? Uh, well, uh, it, it evolved uh, out of an idea just to have a band, and that's what I wanted to do when I went to Greensboro. I had a drummer. We t- tried different combinations of people. You know, We wanted to have a band that could play because I had a format I thought I could get booked in places without relying on the art scene necessarily and the avant-garde. <laughs> lawyer that said nobody's copyrighted that name except uh, uh, like a power drill company or something oh sure and they said in that he said in that case it only means you can't sell a tool called yeah. shockability that okay. doesn't mean you can't have music called shockability I mean it's, it's like so that was funny but that was uh, people would think that it was kind of like the cramps. In fact, we were supposed or to like open. Or like has Hazel Adkins or something might be. Yeah, yeah, ability. yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, and so then, like when we would do country and western, those people would freak out. Like what? You know, they didn't want to hear that. Whereas, like, a rockabilly audience likes country and western, so that was kind of weird. Yeah, but that's something. But uh, a lot of aspects of it, people kind of didn't quite understand. Another thing you were going against at the time was like. I, I like to think of myself as a heavy guitar player. I like to play guitar. I like to play solos. Uh, I like to think when I'm playing a solo, this time I'm going to play as well as Coltrane or something. I like it. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm trying. And at that time, nobody wanted to hear it. The, the, the punk bands didn't have guitar soloists. Right. Yeah, that was the whole idea. There's the antithesis of punk. In fact, it kind of lumped it in with like uh, this prog rock and stuff, which is a right. fine. I don't. I like some of that stuff, but I was imitating jazz, you know, and the idea that a guy could play a long solo and it would be interesting, you know. Yeah. So and the band, it would be an improvised thing. So, but that was something that was outside the realm of a lot of the, the music at the time, you know. So, uh, but I think eventually things kind of caught up with me. Uh, in that it's now it's quite normal. I remember um, uh, I started sometimes getting asked to jam with this band Leftover Salmon when they were around. I would play banjo with them, and I remember thinking, well, this they were kind of much more. They were sort of like the Grateful Dead yeah. band band crowd, but right, they're dead. <laughs> and the banjo player was great, and I the singer had an incredible energy, and they also the drummer Jeff Sipes was a great jazz drummer and everything. Okay. He, he used to play with Colonel Bruce Hampton. He's really a great drummer. I still play with him sometimes. So I liked playing with them, and I used to, when I listened to their repertoire, other than, like, there were things they did that I thought were incredibly corny, like Ico Ico and stuff. But basically, we like, this group is mixing together all these genres, which at the time, when I started doing that, people were, like, really thought that was weird, and then that, oh, if you, because you're doing that, you'll never get an audience, you know? And so it's become a little bit more commonplace. Yeah, I feel like things were a lot more stratified, like... If you were... Yeah. You have like, so many like, instances like in the, now where, oh, here's a band that does a whole bluegrass record of fish songs, you know. Here's a yeah. band doing yeah. Pink Floyd bluegrass. You but know? I mean, like, the punk yeah, scene in yeah. particular was pretty stratified. Like, if you, were, oh, yeah. if you were into punk, you couldn't be into these other styles of music. That's and, right. And, yeah. and nowadays, yeah. Yeah. you'll find, like, yeah. someone doing a punk version of this whole, yeah. you know, whole other kind of music or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of some difficult sometimes. Hi, my name is Peter and I live in Spokane, Washington. 
During this time when we are all supposed to stay at home, there aren't any options for the unhoused people in our community. But since 1991, the Low Income Housing Institute has been taking big steps to find a cure for homelessness. Lehigh continues to give thousands of folks in the Pacific Northwest a fresh start, offering guidance, help finding work, and most importantly, keys to their own homes. Lehigh has built a dozen tiny house villages in the Puget Sound area and plans to build more, but they can't do it alone. If you'd like to find out how you can help, you can visit lihi.org. That again is lihi.org. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah. But I mean, um, in in the attitudes, I mean, I think like your artistry is is distinct, and that you you kind of straddle all these different worlds. That you know, we could come up with these like sub 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 genres to define each of the different areas that you're playing in. But like, there aren't that many people around playing in all of these modalities. So, do you have to kind of when you're playing with other people? Do you? Uh, I don't know, you have to kind of pick people that are going to work for a certain project, but it's hard to find people that are going to go all over the map with you from... Well, it's very, there's, yeah, there's different types of things. There's things that happen on a localized level for a night or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, for something more extended, usually uh, I'm playing with a drummer, mm-hmm. and it's usually a relationship. It takes a long time to develop. It's, I mean, it's... Not only the music, but dealing with traveling with people and mm-hmm. stuff, and mm-hmm. someone's flexibility. So I have certain, you know, I have especially like a person I really like working with in uh, Germany uh, and all over Europe, Schroeder. We've been touring, uh, I think, ten years now. We've been doing that uh, on a localized level. I, it, it gets very specific. Basically, sometimes somebody will say, uh, "Would you like some people to play with you?" Sometimes this is just. Improvisers, if it's that kind of thing, then there's really no preparation. Mm-hmm. You just do it. Uh, I, sometimes, though, with somebody who say, uh, okay, such and such a band, they could back you up. Then you, then you start right away talking about, well, what songs do you want to play? Because sure, people sure. kind of want to prepare mm-hmm. some of the time. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of like have to be forced into helping them <laughs> prepare, but I will, you know, I will send lists of songs or talk about keys with people and stuff or whatever. But um, sometimes he, in these situations, they sometimes like to practice, and this is whole kinds of means. Well, you have to stay longer because it's like too tiring to do all this in one mm. in one day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, and then other things. I play. A guy recently hired me to play his fiftieth birthday party. Okay. On a succulent farm in Sarasota, Florida. It's very nice. So it's down there. He noticed I had a couple nights off. And um, yeah, all his friends and stuff were there. And then it became quickly, you know, I could, that it would be really fun to do a little, not only do my set, but do a set with his friends and jam, okay. jam on some Neil Young tunes and stuff, you know. Okay. And, so things Sounds like that great. happen, yeah. you know, and then... It, 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 uh, you know, there's different levels of musicianship. You sort of like, well, I think if a guy's playing uh, rhythm guitar or bass, they need to be able to look at someone else and understand what they're doing. And then really there's not much else you need to do, you know. But uh, if someone's playing a lot of weird substitute chords like me or playing the banjo in a weird tuning, then they, you sometimes have to kind of give them a hint. Or people use their ears, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I think a lot of what's fun for people to listen to is a kind of a spontaneous... Uh, interaction mm-hmm. and then sometimes with people that are not so professional at performing sometimes after they rehearse a lot and start to feel confident then they go to the gig and get nervous and get drunk and then play really horribly so I've been in some situations like that with local musicians where I've actually wanted to take them out and kill them because then I don't sleep all night because I'm thinking, oh, that version of that song was so horrible and what did that bass player think they were doing uh, and it really upsets me, you know. It's my well, mu- it reflects on how people are hearing you. Yeah, right. well, that's just one part of it. But even if I don't even think about that, I think about it, I thought I don't even want to be involved in something like that. And that it, it just upsets me, you know. And and it goes away after a while, especially if there's an, an, a good night. But uh, 
that's a thing where I'm like, well, what do I do? Make a no drinking rule? I mean, I just don't get it, you know. But yeah, I've definitely, I would blame it sometimes, definitely on the alcohol, because the person has played really great at the rehearsal. So hmm. sometimes people, you just say they, you, at a rehearsal, you go play a solo there, and they play. That's great, great, good. That's a good place for you to do a solo. Then the show comes, you look at the huh. They clam up. Or they forget they were supposed to do a solo. They have one <laughs> thing to remember. There was a drummer I used to get pissed off about uh, because uh, the one thing he was supposed to remember was a kind of a false ending in this song. Uh, yeah. This song ends and then he goes, bam, and it starts up again, right? He kept forgetting it. And I, I was like, you know, I have to remember all this other stuff. As soon as a song starts, you just play the beat. You're not remembering anything, really, but that one thing. Why can't you remember that? So, so you have to put up with a lot of weird stuff with people. Yeah. 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 That's always tricky, get people to... But, uh, you know, the uh, there's the other side. Of life. Most of the people are, are, are brilliant and do an incredible job, you know, and then it's mm. just so much fun, you know. Well, and, and then on... On the other side of it, though, like if, if if you're playing in the like improvised music scene, do you get flack from people who are like, "Oh, come on! Like we're trying to do this freeform thing," and Eugene's like playing tunes in the middle of the improvisation? I mean, I don't know if you. get Well, that I'm from known you. for that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the, the the people that don't like it probably don't get involved. They're probably know? not going to get on stage with you at that point. Yeah. I've had comments, you know, like a French guy say. Uh, if you play the country, I don't know this style. And I'm like, well, I know it. I'll play all the chords. Just do whatever you want because that's the whole idea. Yeah. I want to hear a country song with a guy playing a weird hurdy-gurdy yeah. solo on top of yeah. it or something. Yeah, that's absolutely. the whole idea. Yeah. They don't have to learn it. Yeah. So, um, And then sometimes it's really funny, the results, when you... Mm -hmm. when, when you bring it yeah that was a one of the most interesting things was a relationship with with Paul Lovins because the yeah. German drummer because uh, uh, we started working together first for a for a festival in Quebec that's very geared toward improvised music and I so, wanted to go uh, there, Victoria Ville yeah I wanted to go with Jimmy Carl Black and the guy was like uh, you guys don't, basically you're playing a lot of rock and roll and blues and I'm afraid uh, people really won't understand what a great guitar player you are. So he was kind of like being polite about like he wanted to hear more improv. That's a nice I way thought to that was funny because you, yeah. basically playing with Jimmy, the reaction I got from people was, oh, I didn't know you were such a good guitar player until I could hear you playing all the yeah. blues and right. rock and roll with right, him. Right, right, right. So anyway, uh, Paul had uh, and I had been talking about playing, so I said, let's do it with Paul. So uh, we did some concerts, to, and the guy, you know, from Victor always loves to say, I will not present the first meeting. He wants you to have some experience playing with somebody before you do the Victoria. He's presented a lot of first meetings. Yeah, well, but so he likes to say that. <laughs> okay. So we did some shows along the way in Detroit and a couple things in Michigan and New York. And um, slowly we start, I start sneaking a few country songs in. And it comes out that Paul is completely enamored, for instance, with Dionne Warwick and the drums on the Dionne Warwick records and Charlie Watts, of course. Yeah. And he like he realizes, I like playing this. And he had gone through this experience with Cecil Taylor where he said the main thing he learned was you should just play whatever the fuck you want and not, not take orders from anybody, like don't do this style. So he realized, okay, I'll play this stuff. So by the time we get to Victoriaville, we're playing some, some songs. And, you know, the guy was like, what? <laughs> so, but that developed uh, in that way um, with uh, just kind of balancing uh, as much of that as he liked. Okay. And it also was interesting that I would also let him usually choose what songs we play once we got a certain number of them under. When he had a certain number of them under his belt, those are the ones he liked to play. He didn't want to learn new ones. Okay. Yeah, it was interesting. But so, so, of course, one of them we really liked to play, and I mentioned this because I think the guy just died, actually. Paul English was the drummer for Willie Nelson. Okay. And That's Willie right. Nelson wrote a really funny song called Me and Paul about different things that had happened to them on the road. And Paul Lovins and I used to play that. Okay. And we actually called our duet Me and Paul. Oh, oh my God, yeah. that's sweet. Yeah. That's great. That is, that's a lovely song, too. Yeah. 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 Got a lot of merit. Yeah. 
Well, Eugene, I think we're going to take you on some errands and yes. go hang out around Olympia right <laughs> yes, now. Yes, that's right. Um, is there anything you'd like to tell your legions of fans that probably already listen to this show? Uh, I just really appreciate all the support from listeners over the years. I mean, it's great. All right. Now, um, yeah, I think on EugeneChadbourne.com, you'll, you can find uh, the link to the Squarespace shop, which has an impossibly long name, because otherwise I have to pay extra. <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> so anyway, uh, hopefully you can find out how to, but that's a pretty convenient way of purchasing things. Cool. Thanks, you guys. All right. Thanks for talking to us, Eugene. Okay. Thanks for coming and co-hosting Arrington. Absolutely. My pleasure. And thank you, Quality In. Quality In. This episode's brought to you by Super 8. Rock on over London. Quality <laughs> In. It's the best. <laughs> All right. Engineer Miles coming at you. Wanted to give a big thanks to Eugene Shadborn for being such a wonderful guest on today's program, as well as Arrington for his co-hosting duties. Thanks, buddy. The music you're hearing now, as well as in the intro of the show and in the PSA, was made by Warren Lee. And we wanted to say thanks for contributing music to the episode. This episode was co-produced by myself, Miles Rosati, as well as Markley Morrison. Well, that's been another installment of America's leading podcast, Low Profile with Markley Morrison. We'll see you next time. Take it easy.